Hi guys, it's Justin Zeltzer here from Z Statistics. Uh, now doing a suite of videos uh, looking at the assumptions underlying regression. And more to the point, what happens when we violate those assumptions. So this first video is to do with heteroscedasticity. That's the name of the game today. And in this video, we're going to be looking at uh, the technical definition of heteroscedasticity. We'll be asking ourselves why we care about it in the first place at all. Um, we'll discuss three different ways of detecting it in your data from um, very simple ways to more statistically robust means of detection. Uh, and then incidentally, we'll have three different remedies we can utilize to um, correct for heteroscedasticity. And finally, I'll provide you with a few real world examples of where heteroscedasticity would exist. So let's tuck in, shall we? Now, the example we are going to be using in this video is of Sydney property sale prices. Um, and we've got the sale price, the house sale price here on the left in millions of Australian dollars. And the lot size on the bottom here. The theory obviously being that for a greater lot size, you might expect a larger house price. But of course, there's a whole lot of other variables that would intervene in that relationship, such as location, for example. But we're going to keep it real simple in this video. We're just going to look at house price as a function of lot size. So what's the technical definition of heteroscedasticity? Well, it's said to occur when the variance of y given x is not constant. So looking back at our plot here on our left, that's our scatter plot of the house prices versus lot size. If we're going to assess the variance of y given x, it's often good to put together a residual plot. So to do that, imagine you've drawn a line of best fit through our left plot over here. And in doing so, we create an expected value of y along that line for a given value of x. Now, if you take that line and kind of bend it sideways so that it's horizontal, you'll get what's called a residual plot. So these points here represent the distance from that line of best fit for each of the observations. And you can really get a sense that, especially at the beginning, as you increase your value of x, the variance of y, which is kind of like that vertical distance, the vertical spread, keeps increasing. Arguably, it might sort of stop around here, but nonetheless, there appears to be this increasing variance of y as x increases. The, cross, the vertical cross sections become more and more spread out. And that's known as heteroscedasticity. Hetero meaning more than one, and scedasticity meaning, well, variance for whatever reason. In fact, if you know where the word scedasticity comes from, feel free to write a comment down at the bottom of this video because I am keen to know because that's a ridiculous word. Nonetheless, this relationship suffers from heteroscedasticity. I'm going to just provide you with a couple of other examples of heteroscedastic relationships between theoretical variables y and x. So in our scatter plot on the left here, you can see you've almost got this positive relationship between y and x. But if we were to look at the residuals, you definitely get a sense that there's a sort of bow tie effect where the smaller variances exist for sort of mean values of x. And as x gets a bit more extreme on both sides, you get a larger variance. And that's still heteroscedastic, although perhaps a different form than our property price example. You might see something like this, which is almost the reverse. You've got this funnel going the other way, where if you look at our residual plot here, the variance is larger for small variance values of x. So I guess I'm just trying to show you that there's not one size fits all for heteroscedastic errors. Uh, this particular example has a kind of, might, you might argue there's a constant variance up until a point and then it blows out after a certain value of x. And that could happen in real life. I mean, say you're taking some measurements from a, a rocket or something like that and at some speed the rocket engages another engine. You can see I don't know anything about uh, mechanics or engineering, but you can imagine that there would be some scenario where after a certain point of X, your variance blows out like this. So 
So in reality, we're looking for something a little bit like this in our residual plot. And this is what's called homoscedastic errors. So whenever you run a regression, it's expecting the error terms or the residuals to be homoscedastic. It's expecting a nice even spread of these error terms. So if our regression violates this, we're going to have problems. So let's find out what problems we're going to have. Why do we care about this at all? Or more specifically, what happens if we just run the model and ignore the violation of this regression assumption? So, we've got heteroscedasticity and we run property price as a function of lot size. Let's draw a line of best fit because <clears throat> that, re in reality, is what a regression is. Now, if you've just come to this video cold, you might want to have a look at my first few videos on regression, the basics of regression in this series. So, um, feel free to have a look at those. I'm not going to double up on that material, so I'll take that as read. Imagine that our output from this regression is given below. So, we have our estimates here. That's our coefficients. That's the, the intercept here is 800,000 and our lot size coefficient of lot size is 455. <clears throat> so if you run the model, your coefficients, those that I just read out, are still unbiased. And what that means is that it's still an accurate reflection of what it's trying to estimate. Our best estimate for the true effect of lot size on house price is still 455.95. That's the coefficient or the gradient of this line of best fit. But what happens in the presence of heteroscedasticity is that the standard errors are incorrect. So everything else in this output, you can't rely on. So these standard errors provided here, which in turn provide us the T values and the P values over here, these are suspect now. We can't rely on them. I mean, in reality, you can look at these P values and you'll note that they're very, very, very small indeed. So we can be quite confident there's a positive relationship between lot size and house price. But the principle still stands. We can't really rely, statistically speaking, on anything else in the output. And that's a problem, right? What tends to happen is that in the presence of heteroscedasticity, the standard errors are underrepresented, meaning that your output will give you smaller standard errors than should be the case. I guess that means that if your variables turn out to be significant, you have to think to yourself, oh, maybe it's just the model making it seem more significant because with lower standard errors, you're going to have more significant variables. So you can see how it would get confusing. So how do we detect heteroscedasticity? Well, well, you've already seen one of those methods of detection, which is just to look at the residual plot. So if you saw one that looks a bit like this, you'd go, you know what? Heteroscedasticity is not a problem. But for our version, if you recall it from the previous slide, we did have a problem. You can see quite clearly there was a sort of funnel effect for our residual plot. But if you wanted to get a little bit more statistical about your testing, you could conduct the Goldfeld quant test, which was something created in 1965 by a couple of statisticians. I'll give you the brief overview of how this works. The first thing you're going to do is order the data by the offending variable, which in this case would be lot size. And you'll split the data into two separate segments. So here we've got a segment here on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. Now, you don't need to split it right in the middle, but maybe for ease's sake, you just halve the data and put half of it on the left-hand side and half of it on the right-hand side of lot size. Then what you're going to do is run separate regressions on each segment. So you can see here, I've got a regression on the left and a regression on the right. Now, these two regressions need not meet up and they also need not have the same variance of error terms around them. And guess what you're going to do? You're going to compare the variance estimates for each of these regressions. So if the variance of our pink regression over here is a lot smaller than the variance of the observations around our yellow regression, 
then that might be evidence of heteroscedasticity. So technically what you're trying to find is this F statistic, which is the mean squared error of regression A and the mean squared error of regression B in a ratio. Now just be aware that when I use the letters MSE in this video, and in fact in all of my videos, if I use MSE or SSE, the E stands for error, not explained. Um, it's very easy to confuse the two, and I appreciate there's two different conventions that sort of go either way. Um, so I'll be very explicit here as to when I'm using letters like MSE and SSE, that the E stands for error. So indeed, likewise here, the E in SSE stands for the sum of squared errors of regression A divided by the degrees of freedom of regression A and the sum of squared errors of regression B divided by the degrees of freedom of regression B. So that, that is actually the mean squared error on top and bottom there, just expanding it out for you. And if I was to expand it out further, the degrees of freedom becomes n minus p minus 1, where p is just the number of x variables, which is going to be the same in both a and b regressions. p is just going to be 1 in both of those. So I'm just showing you that if you needed to, you could calculate this, well, almost by hand. You'd hopefully be given from your regression output SSE of regression A and SSE of regression B. But this equation, MSE of regression A divided by MSE of regression B, that is distributed, that's distributed as an F statistic. So you could use that to assess whether you would reject a null hypothesis of homoscedasticity. So in reality, you will find in all of your statistical software an ability to provide a Goldfield quant test on your data. And you might have to provide a cut point that you want to use or something like that. It might also ask you for a cutout region. Um, the cutout region would just be some kind of like no man's land in between that's neither in regression A or regression B. So it gives a nice, nice buffer between the two regressions. But if you specify that in your statistical software, it'll provide you with a Goldfield quant test. And in reality, all you need to do is look at that p-value that it's providing you. And if it's less than 0.05, we know that heteroscedasticity is a problem, at least at the 5% level of significance. All right, so what's another way of detecting heteroscedasticity? Well, this is called the Broich-Pagan test, or it was uh, modified to, call, to be called White's test in 1980, but it's pretty much the same thing. Um, essentially what happens here is that the first step is you estimate a single linear regression as you might if there was no heteroscedasticity present. And you'll get a line of best fit or a regression line like so. The next thing you're going to do is save the residuals. So whenever you run a regression, you can actually capture the residuals of each of these observations. So this residual will be positive, some of these will be negatives, etc. You're going to save those residuals and then what you're going to do is actually run a new regression using the squared errors as your new y variable. So in other words, we're going to run a regression where we try to explain the squared errors, or in other words, some measure of the variance of the errors. We're going to try to explain the variance of the errors by x. Now try to appreciate what that means. If x is significant in explaining the variance of the errors, then heteroscedasticity must be present. So if we run this, reg this new regression and we find the R squared of this regression, we can construct what's called a, an LM statistic. It's called a Lagrange multiplier, but look, let's not, let's not get fancy. You can find the R squared and multiply that by n, which is the number of observations. And that is distributed as a chi-squared statistic with p degrees of freedom. Now here I'm using p to be the number of x variables to keep it consistent with my previous usage of the letter p. You might find some resources saying p minus 1 degrees of freedom here, where they've defined p 
to be the total number of variables, which includes y. So just keep that in mind. P for me is the number of x variables, which is one. So much like last time, we'll have a null hypothesis, which is that there is no heteroscedasticity, or we could say homoscedasticity. And in your output you might get from your statistical software, if you were to run a bloch pagan test or White's test, you can just have a look at the p-value. Again, if the p-value is less than 0.05, you got problems. In other words, you've got heteroscedasticity. Cool. So now that we know we have heteroscedasticity in our model, what the hell do we do about it? One really easy remedy for you is to use White's standard errors. And I say it's easy because all you need to do is find out how to do it using your statistical software and then just add it to your code as an option. And it will provide for you regression output that has White's standard errors in there. And essentially what it does is it corrects for that heteroscedasticity. Remember how a few slides ago, I mentioned that heteroscedasticity affects our standard errors? Well, White attempts to correct for that. Now, if you're not down with matrix algebra, feel free to skip to the next section. But if you're like me, you don't enjoy using black box solutions and you want to know a little bit about how say white's standard errors are created and i'm going to do my best very quickly to explain how that would work using matrix algebra so this expression tells us that it's the variance of the betas which is a vector of betas here so this is a general equation for where you might have numerous x variables in your model so numerous coefficients we only have two coefficients in our model the constant term and the slope coefficient but this could be generalized to as many as you like. Now, x is just a matrix of all the x values that you have in your model. And this little fellow in the middle is what's called the variance, covariance matrix of all of the observations. So if we have, say, 100 observations, this matrix is 100 by 100. And what's on the positive diagonal here is the variance of each of the observations. And off that diagonal, these are all the covariances between each pair of observations. So if we assume that the observations are independent, so one doesn't depend on another one, then all of those off diagonal elements are zero because there is no covariance between pairings of observations. So we only have this positive diagonal to worry about. And as this is the variance of each observation, if we have homoscedastic errors, so if there is no violation of our constant variance assumption, then all of those are actually the same thing. And we can call them sigma squared or even simpler. We can say that our variance covariance matrix is just sigma squared times what's called the identity matrix, but it's just a whole lot of ones on that diagonal. Now, if you were to put that into our expression for the variance of the beta vector, things will simplify really nicely. Let's see how that works. If I put in sigma squared i instead of our variance covariance matrix there, because it's a scalar in that it's just a number, it can come out the front and everything reduces really, really sweetly. And we get this expression here for the variance of our betas. And the variance of our betas, that'll help us find the standard errors because all we need to do essentially is square root the final answer we get to get our standard error. So this is what's happening behind the scenes in your regression output. You just press the button and it provides you with a standard error of each of those coefficients. But it does this calculation and it comes up with the standard errors using all of the data that it's been provided. Now let's go back a step and, and ask what happens if we cannot assume that the variance is constant. So this diagonal here, you can see now has subscripts, meaning that each observation may have a different variance. So to get White's standard errors, what happens is that the regression, the initial regression is run and the standard errors are estimated for each of the individual observations. So we now have E squared for observation one, E squared for observation two, E squared for observation N. And those estimated values gets plonked in to our variance covariance part of this whole formula. 
And then what happens is it just executes that whole thing to calculate the new variance of this beta vector. So that's it. That's as deep as I'm getting, but I kind of wanted to give you a quick overview as to how it all fits together. But in reality, what you're going to do if you're in SAS or you're in R or SPSS or Stata or whatever, you're just going to ask the software to provide you with White's standard errors. They're also known as heteroscedastic corrected errors or robust errors. There's a few words for them, but essentially they correct for heteroscedasticity. Remedy two, let's see what else we can do. This is weighted least squares. It's quite interesting this one actually. So let's go back to our example. Um, unlike using White's standard errors, here we must know or at least specify the form of the heteroscedasticity. So in our original regression model, we have house price as a function of lot size, lot size being X. Now let's say that the variance, we know that the variance increases with X, but let's just say that it in fact increases linearly with X. So as X increases, the variance of the error term will increase linearly. So we've got sigma, sigma squared, which is our constant term, times our X value. Now if we specify this as our form of heteroscedasticity, what happens is the variance of our error term in the end of this equation is no longer constant and that's a problem. So bear with me here, what we're going to do is we're going to divide everything in the equation by the square root of the problem. What? Let me say that again, we're going to divide everything in the equation by the square root of the problem and the problem here is x, xi, right? We want to get rid of that from our variance of the error term. So just run with me for a second, okay, before you uh, before you flip out, I've got that same regression here, but now I divide everything by the square root of x. Realistically, that's not so difficult. All you're doing is you're, you can create a new variable, which is just our original y variable, divided by whatever x variable you had for that observation with a square root on it. You're essentially creating for yourself a new weighted value of y. Similarly for our x variable is now just the original x variable divided by the square root of x. And notice the original error term is there also divided by the square root of x. Now I'm going to zoom in on this because it's going to get a little bit funky. What's the variance of this new error term? All right, the new error term is the original error term on the square root of x. Now hopefully you know a little bit about rules around variance, but any constant term inside a variance can come out the front and get squared. So say I have the variance of 3z, that's 9 times the variance of z. So in this case I have the variance of the error term over the square root of x. Now this is a constant term for every given observation. Sounds a bit strange, but if I tell you that, hey, this x observation is 30, then that's constant. You can't change that. The error associated with that value changes depending on the regression, but the x value doesn't. So that's constant and can come out the front as long as we square it. So we square the square root of x and it becomes 1 on x times the variance of the error term. Now what's the variance of the original error term? We already established it was sigma squared x and guess what happens? they're going to cancel out and you're going to get a constant term for your variance of the error term now. So if we backtrack a little bit, the whole reason why we divided by the square root of the problem was that we knew it was kind of going to square itself when we looked at the variance. And so all you really need to do is run a regression using a new y variable which is divided by the square root of x and a new x variable which is divided by the square root of x. So you're essentially creating two new variables for yourself and running the regression on that. What's the problem with that? You might think, well, it's interpreting your regression output is going to be a little bit more difficult in that situation, but at least for the purposes of creating a heteroscedasticity free regression, you'll be on fire. Finally, 
Another remedy for heteroscedasticity is just to log things. And you'll find that for a lot of statistical problems, if you log variables, the problems just disappear. And there's good reasons for that. Now, I'm not going to get too philosophical about it and get real deep in it, but there's clearly something that is quite helpful about logging variables. So let's just see what happens. I mean, have a look at the original scatter plot, which is price versus lot size. If I logged everything, look, it doesn't cure the problem completely, but you can see it already makes things a lot more sort of even across the whole across the board. These first few ones might still be the exception, but if you sort of start the regression around here, it kind of looks pretty even, really. Looking at the residuals, yeah, you really get that impression that where there was a definite funneling that happens in the original regression, a lot of that funneling has been mitigated if I've logged both variables. So again, something you might want to consider if you've got a problem of heteroscedasticity in your model. So finally now, let's just have a look at some examples of heteroscedasticity that you might see in real life because it's all... Because we can talk theoretically about things, but why bother learning about this stuff if it's never going to come up in your statistical adventures? Um, whenever you're looking at expenditure as a function of income, you'll tend to get heteroscedasticity as when your income increases, it allows for extra expenditure, but it doesn't necessitate extra expenditure. expenditure. Income as a function of age might also exhibit that same heteroscedastic flavor because because people on when they're you can say 20 year olds and 21 year olds there's only so much that they can possibly earn without much experience right but as your age increases you get a lot of people that earn they can earn a lot more money but again you can get people that earn not so much money so you'll get that variance increasing with increasing age um, here's one that enters the realms of, say, physics. But if you're trying to measure the speed of something, the faster that thing goes, the more variance you'll have in your estimates of that speed because it's just harder to measure. So say you're trying to measure the speed of a rocket or something, right? When it's lifting off, pretty easy to measure the speed when it's going quite slowly and your margin of error will be quite small. But after it's out in space, which is not only far away from you, but it's traveling at huge speeds, your margin of error of your speed estimates will be a lot larger. There you have it. That is heteroscedasticity. If you've got any questions at all, feel free to post them down below in the comment section. I'm Justin Zeltzer. If you want to get in contact otherwise, here are my socials. I'll catch you around.